We're in Revelation 2. We've been looking at the seven churches of Asia. Now, for the first 300 years of the church's existence, the brethren faced the challenge of paganism persecution. They faced persecution from Jews. They faced, uh, faced persecution from the imperial cult, which we'll discuss a bit more momentarily. Some in the early church denied Christ. They simply declined to identify with Jesus. And of course, he told his apostles when he sent them on the limited commission, Matthew 10, 32, 33, whoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. And yes, there were those that denied Jesus because of persecution. Bible history shows that there were many who were faithful, who endured atrocities, up to the point of death, yes, loss of property, separation of family, the external persecution was a serious threat, particularly to those whose faith might be described as a bit of a weaker faith, but internal toleration and compromise was likewise a threat. There, there is within the human psyche a certain desire for the best of both worlds. And that desire will lead, that inclination will inevitably move toward the idea of compromise. And Satan knows that tool of compromise quite well. And yes, that can deteriorate faith as well as persecution. Revelation 2.12, the church just described was the church at uh, Smyrna. They had endured. Be thou faithful unto death, I'll give thee a crown of life, for Christ's words, Revelation 2.10. When we get to verse 12, he's speaking to the church at Pergamos. The church at Pergamos has a problem, and that problem is going to be tolerance, compromise. We'll get to that momentarily, but for them, tolerance was far deadlier a threat than tribulation. Problems within were a greater threat than persecution from without. Seven letters. This is letter number three. If we start at Ephesus, which would be... Uh, uh, the furthermost uh, east of those congregations and move our way uh, uh, clockwise, this is the third in line. We take a look at the church at Pergamos. Some ideas to mention, and keep in mind John's, uh, John's inspired record here is a visual one. And what John describes is indeed... A, a, a visual depiction, not only of what he's hearing, but of what he's seeing. We behold the city. And in beholding the city, eventually, maybe we don't have a PowerPoint uh, opened up for us. I promise there's one up there. Uh, we, ta we behold the city. And Pergamos was known first and foremost as an illustrious city. The physical records for this city began all the way back as late as 452 B.C., and it is thought to have been somewhat prominent and influential even prior to 452 B.C. The first coins made there dated to 452 B.C. Alexander the Great uh, had a number of, we'll call them generals, uh, uh, military aides, that would uh, take a position of influence following his death. One of these was a man named Lysimachus, or Lysimachus, however you want to pronounce it. I like Lysimachus just to sound Tennessee when I say it. But Lysimachus inherited Pergamos as part of the area after Alexander the Great died that was underneath, uh, under his purview. So it was strongly influenced by the Greeks from the other side of the Aegean. Uh, Italus the first from 241 to 197 BC of the Italid dynasty uh, began building Pergamos to be a, a, a rather monumental city, beautiful buildings. The, the Acropolis of Pergamos, which I'd show you a picture, but apparently there's uh, no hope. Oh, wait a minute, here we go. Now we've got some motion. The Acropolis of Pergamos uh, was quite ornate and it developed over the course of time. See if we can get this to work for us. This was the original Acropolis, a temple of Zeus built right there. Later, the temple to Trajan, the emperor, would be built uh, at the, a higher point of the city. 
those just being parts of the prominent details of said city of Pergamos. Now, an illustrious city, 190 BC, the Romans helped the Attalids, you heard of Attalus' name a moment ago, uh, the Romans helped the Attalids expel Syria's Antiochus III. By 133 B.C., Attalus III had died, and he bequeathed the city to the Romans who had helped him uh, and his family expel Antiochus. So here's Attalus III dying. He leaves the city and the kingdom to Rome. Now, there would be a four-year conflict following that between Attalus' son and Rome, but ultimately, by the time you get to 129 B.C., Pergamos is not only under uh, Roman authority, they're made the capital of Asia from the Roman perspective. And this would be the case for, almost 200 year, uh, for over 200 years. So here is a city that has received prominence because of its relationship with Rome and aid gained from Rome. But as a capital, it was more of a commercial... Uh, uh, more rather of a religious center than a commercial center. The commerce was in Smyrna, the, the city we discussed last week. Its glory days would go until about the 3rd century A.D. So we talk about the illustrious city. That temple to Trajan at the highest point of the city was made of a white marble. Something to keep in mind later. Uh, the temple to Zeus that we identify that's in a lower part of the city was actually shaped like an oversized throne, uh, an altar of 40 feet. This city was known for its ornate architecture, reflective of various influences, but not only was it an illustrious city, it was an intellectual city. And by intellectual, it was a city of politics and religion more than commerce. It, it was a city of, uh, of, of thinkers, if you will, or at least they thought so. They had a library with over 200,000 volumes second only to the Alexandrian Library in Egypt. In fact, at one point, the, uh, the people of Egypt, particularly those connected to the library, convinced uh, Ptolemy, the, the leader of the, the Greek run Egyptian area, convinced Ptolemy to uh, essentially to put an embargo on the shipment of papyrus so that no papyrus would be going to Pergamos. They wanted to limit the size of the library in Pergamos so their library could stand prominent. The people of Pergamos decided they would start using hides of animals, and they developed something that might be familiar to you. It's called parchment. And the reason parchment was developed and the reason the, the writing material that would last for so long in terms of uh, preserving that which was written upon it, it was written out of necessity. The Egyptians wanted to act like children, so the people of Pergamos decided necessity was the mother of invention, and they brought about uh, parchment. It was an intellectual city. Now this library that was possessed in Pergamos was eventually given to the Library of Egypt. There's one to make you want to bang your head on a wall. But it was eventually given to be a part of the Library of Egypt uh, because Antony wanted to give his girlfriend Cleopatra a, a big present. And, and that's essentially how that came into being. By the time we get to uh, near the end of the first century, this is a city that's lost a little bit of its glory. It still has some, but, but the library is gone. However, with all of its illustrious nature, with all of its intellectual background, it's also an idolatrous city. Now we say that they had the popular Asiatic cult, they had the, the cultured Greek religion, and they also uh, had the official Roman emperor cult there. And in terms of the Greeks, they had a temple to Athena, they had that temple to Zeus that we mentioned earlier, and, and they also had a, a worship to Hera, the Asiatic cultures, they worship Dionysius, also Bacchus, the uh, god of wine. Asclepius. Now, Asclepius was the medicine god. You remember when Moses and the children of Israel were moving uh, through the wilderness and uh, the people began to murmur, so God sent snakes among them, and ultimately the remedy for the snakes was to look upon that bronze serpent. It eventually came to be called Nehushtan by Hezekiah's day. In Pergamos, 
they worshipped Asclepius. Now, Asclepius in Greek history is first mentioned as merely a man who was connected to medicine and the father of uh, some uh, doctors. By the time we get to the first century B.C. and uh, the first century A.D., Asclepius is worshipped as a god. And the symbol of Asclepius is uh, a pair of serpents wrapped around a staff. You still see that symbol today on most ambulances and anything pertaining to a hospital. It's that medical symbol. Pergamus was where Asclepius was worshipped. He was considered the medicine god. His healings were often connected to incantations or the idea of some sort of miraculous healing. But this was a place where there was a school of medicine that was uh, conducted. The intellect of a school of medicine, th this was essentially the uh, M.D. Anderson of the area, but it's connected to idolatry. Now move that forward and you think about some of the other worship that took place there. They worshiped the Caesars. They worshiped Caesar Augustus. Uh, 29 B.C. They worship Trajan, that temple that we uh, discussed earlier that's built up on the hill. Most of the images you'll see tonight will pertain to that uh, Trajanium, the, the uh, altar to Trajan. They worshiped Severus. They had the temple for Roma Augusta built there in 29 B.C. And uh, it said that this was the first real center of the imperial cult worship in Asia. This city had many significant features about it, but when it came right down to it, it was illustrious, it was intellectual, and it was idolatrous. Now let's look at Christ and the way He describes Himself. Revelation 2.12, To the angel of the church at Pergamos write, These things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. He that has the sharp sword with two edges. Jesus describes Himself as bearing a sword. In that day and age, the Roman emperor was considered the seat of authority, the ultimate judge, the ultimate power. And the Romphaea sword described here, this is not the, uh, the Machaera sword uh, that is often used elsewhere in Scripture. Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the Spirit. This isn't that word translated sword. This isn't the sword that described the, the Roman soldier's sword. This was more of a sword of authority, a sword of judgment, a sword of execution. Jesus says that He's the one that has that sword of judgment, authority coming from His mouth. This is the sword that was used, uh, described by Simeon, Luke 2.35, when He told Jesus' mother, A sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. This was the type of sword mentioned back in Revelation 1.16 and also mentioned throughout the, the book of Revelation. It's a depiction of authority. And that's going to be important because with this authority comes judgment. You might remember John 12.48. Jesus said, He that rejects me or receives not my words has one that judges him. The word I've spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. We can reject Christ's authority, but His authority is still going to be that which, judge, which judges. That was the case in uh, Christ's day when He spoke to the Hebrews. Those that rejected His identity, the Jews that rejected His authority, He told them, Matthew 23, 37 and 38, How often I would have gathered you unto myself as a hen gathered her chicks, but you wouldn't do it. Your house is left to you desolate. The rejection brought judgment. Keep that thought in mind as we move forward and discuss the one who has the sword coming from his mouth. He bears the sword, and that sword pertains to his word. But not just the sword of the Spirit, the word of God in general. This is going to pertain to the judgment, uh, the ultimate authority of his word and the judgment that comes to those that reject it. Thus, when we think about the sword that comes from his mouth, for those of faith, it's heartwarming. Second Peter 3, 9, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He's long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What he says, he says with the desire of bringing souls to repentance. His authority is intended to bring us to him. But for those who are not of faith, for those who reject what he has to say, it's not heartwarming, it's a hard warning. He says, I've got a sword coming out of my mouth. We can either capitulate to it, submit to it, surrender to it, or be conquered by it. So, unto the angel of the church of Pergamos, we beheld the 
the city. We beheld Christ in His description of Himself. Let's move forward and look at the church. Picking up Revelation 2, 13. These things saith he that hath the, the, the sharp sword with two edges, I know thy works. I know your general behavior. Your ergon is the word translated works. It's the same way that he begins each of these other letters. I know thy works. I know how you act. I know your conduct, your behavior. Not only do I know your works, I know where you're living. I know that you are living where Satan's seat is. And where you are living, you have you've not denied my name. You've held to my faith. Even in the days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. As Jesus describes the church there, this church had been triumphant over tribulation and terror. They had not succumbed to deny Christ. They held to His name. It's unlikely that the reference to Antipas, my faithful martyr, uh, it refers to just one occasion where one, a Christian, one Christian died. We know nothing about Antipas save what is said here. But it would seem to be that this is the most prominent of the Christians whose lives had been taken because of persecution. And the same steadfastness that Antipas had exhibited when his life was taken, whether it was by a raging mob or by a government decision, whatever the circumstances of Antipas' life being taken, of him being slain, Jesus identifies that same steadfastness with the brethren in Pergamos. You've not denied my name either. You've held fast to my faith as well. So they've been faithful. He knew what they faced. Keep in mind, he said back in Revelation 2, 1, that he dwelleth among the seven candlesticks. Dwelleth. Constantly dwells among. He's ever present with the churches. He knows what's taking place. He knows what's uh, he knows the goings-on, if you will, of each congregation. He knows the strengths. He knows the weaknesses. He knows that they are where Satan's seat is. Some will debate about whether this refers to that temple of Zeus that was actually shaped somewhat like a throne, or whether this refers to the temple to Trajan and the emperor worship. Keep in mind... When we read that letter to the church at Smyrna, Jesus discussed those that were of the synagogue of Satan. They're not of the synagogue of Trajan. They're not of the synagogue of emperor worship per se. They're not even necessarily the synagogue of paganism. They're of the synagogue that has rejected Christ. They're of the synagogue that still claims Judaism, but they're willing to persecute Christians. When you read in the book of Revelation that which pertains to Satan, yes, we're talking about the one who's been described since Genesis 3. We are talking about the adversary, the enemy, and we're talking about the influence that he wields. When Jesus spoke of the synagogue of Satan, He was speaking of those Jews who would persecute Christians. They're doing Satan, Satan's bidding as they do it. When He speaks of where Satan's seat is, uh, where Satan dwelleth, He's speaking of the influence of persecution, and here it's going to be connected to paganism and emperor worship. But instead of trying to narrow it down to just one, if we'll keep in mind that the reference to Satan is a reference to the enemy of God and the enemy of God's people and the one who is endeavoring to uh, overpower them, th then we won't get bogged down w with the intricacies of trying to identif identify certain features instead of drawing the real principle from it. You dwell where the enemy is. And you've not waved the white flag. You dwell where the enemy is. And you've not decided that you'll wear the enemy's name. You've held to my name. You've not denied by faith. He knew what they had faced. He knew their faith. Despite trial, they not refused His name, and His name is a reflection of Him. 
If you take a piece of paper, if I were to take a piece of paper and write your, one of your children's name, uh, a name of one of your children on that piece of paper, and then they just took it and tore it right in front of you, would that be offensive? Names mean things, right? Names are representative of the one who bears the name. When Jesus said, you've not but denied my name, the point is you've not denied me. You've not overtly denied my authority nor my identity. He knew what they had faced. He knew their faith. And he also knew of their fallen. He knew of Antipas, that faithful martyr. And as we mentioned last week, when Jesus says, I know, particularly as it pertains to, I know the hardships you're facing, that ought to be as comforting as when mom or dad would tell you over that skin knee, I know. I know it hurts. I know what you're facing. I, I know what the hardships are. I'm not ignoring you. I'm not oblivious to, to what you're enduring. I know. And he knows because he cares. The church was triumphant over tribulation and terror, yet we get to verse 14, and it begins with the word but. But I have a few things against thee. A few things. Few, small, minority. Perhaps the point is that there are only a few that are guilty of what he's about to describe, but the rest of the church is not taking action about it or pertaining to it. I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. And they also have there, uh, verse 15, so hast thou them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Two different bodies of doctrine described here. The doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Apparently, even among those that had not denied Jesus, they'd not debated error. they not refused His name. they not turned from the faith, but they not defended it either. Some were neither adopting error, nor were they rebuking it. Christians' tolerance is not love. A blind eye is not care. Now, is there a time for patience? Is there a time for long-suffering? God exhibits it. That's one of His fundamental attributes. See Exodus 34, 5 and following. Yes, we are to exercise long-suffering and patience, but not tolerance. The church in Pergamos was guilty of tolerance. As such, because of their tolerance, they had their, those that held the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam was that prophet that prophesied for prophet, the one to whom Balak came and said, hey, curse this people for me. And he travels all the way from Mesopotamia to come to uh, the region outside of Canaan. Uh, the Israelites are passing through Midian and Moab, and here's uh, Balak, king of uh, Moab, saying, curse the Israelites for me. Balaam said, I can only say, tell you what God tells me to tell you. Now, we read what Balaam had to say in Numbers 22, 23, and 24, and we might think, hey, he said exactly what God said to say. Amen. Way to go, Balaam. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. The Bible's its own best commentator, and there is not a single word of commendation directed toward Balaam in all of the New Testament. Every time his name is mentioned, it is mentioned as him being the enemy of God's people. In fact, when he met his demise, by the time you get to Numbers 31, 8, he was found dead among the enemies of God's people because that's where he hung his hat. So what was Balaam's problem? He's described... Revelation 2, 14, as having uh, taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Yes, he's the one that told Balak, I can only tell you what God tells me. He's the one that repeatedly came back and, and exhibited blessings to Israel instead of cursings because that's what God told him to say. Flip over to Numbers 23, uh, 22 for just a moment. And once you get to Numbers 22, go to Numbers 23, because I told you the wrong chapter. Numbers 23, verse 9. For from the top of the rocks I see, 
I, I, I see him. From the hills I behold him. This is speaking of Israel as a, 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 a people, a group, an entity. From the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and not be reckoned among the nations. One of the reasons that God refused to curse Israel uh, with Balaam was because this people was dwelling distinct, alone, and different. They weren't among the nations. They weren't acting like the heathen. They were different. They thought they were the only ones going to heaven. They were different. They didn't act like the world around them. Stay in Numbers 23. This time skip down to verse 21. Here's what God had not seen. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God's not seen sin among them. He's not going to curse them. And by the time we get to the end of Numbers 24... Balaam has told Balak, I can't curse them. Balak says, get on out of here. Talk to him sort of like you would a rabid dog that comes up on, uh, in the yard. But by the time we get to Numbers 31, Balaam has turned around and come back to Balak. I wonder. Revelation 2.14 says he taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. But Balaam was dedicated only to telling Balak what God had said. I wonder... Could it be that he took the truths of Numbers 23, 9, Numbers 23, 21, and said, Hey, if you can't beat them, get them to join you. God said they're not like the nations. Balak, let's make them like us. God said he's not seen iniquity among them. Well, let's just go ahead and infiltrate, shall we? Balaam rode away into the proverbial sunrise, because he went back east at first, at the end of Numbers 24. Numbers 25, beginning of the chapter. Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit fornication, whoredom, with the daughters of Moab. We mentioned Balak, king of Moab, a moment ago. Israel abode in Shittim. They commit, man, began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people, they called the Israelites, unto the sacrifices of their idols. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. They invited them to a fellowship meal. That fellowship meal led to a worship service and promiscuity. If you can't beat them, get them to join you. God said His people are to be different. Balaam told Balak, let's make them like us. Now let's come back to Revelation 2. Jesus tells the church in Pergamos, I've got something against you. Because you have there them that act just like Balaam did. They are teaching God's people to compromise with the world around them. And they are casting a stumbling block before God's people, just like Balaam did with Israel. The stumbling block with Balaam, let's show them the pretty daughters of Moab and Midian and get them to engage in promiscuity with them. They'll eat at the table, they'll lay in the beds, and they'll die. You have there them that teach, hold the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam is a doctrine of compromise. The doctrine of Balaam is a doctrine of let's get God's people to act like the society around them and still convince them that they are holy Israel. The doctrine of Balaam is the doctrine being taught in far too, of these, ta far too many of these places we call Christian universities. The doctrine of Balaam is the doctrine being spouted from far too many pulpits that are afraid to give a book, chapter, verse answer to matters of morality because somebody might get his feelings hurt. The doctrine of Balaam ain't got no spine, nor does it have a relationship with God. And Jesus has nothing for it. You have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. And moving forward from the doctrine of Balaam, 
these people that are trying to avoid being outcast by compromising. You have the, those that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, one commentator, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is a bit up in the air in terms of the specifics of it, but the closest we can come to a conclusion is that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was the philosophy that a Christian isn't under moral law. It's the antinomians who said that law doesn't apply to Christians, uh, uh, sin doesn't count. It's the once saved, always saved idea that, that breeds within the one who espouses that mindset, the idea that I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, and get away with it. The Nicolaitans held a doctrine that Jesus said, I hate it. He said he hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, Revelation 2.6. I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Revelation 2.15. They're Gnostics. Now remember, one of the things that John emphasized as he refuted the Gnostics and so many of their doctrines was love. The Nicolaitans didn't have any. Jesus said, I hate that doctrine. So, moving forward. We look at the church. They had triumphed over tribulation and terror, but they were, they were tolerating error. And that was the real threat. We come to Revelation 2.16. Let's look at the choices. He gives them two. Those who tolerate error must be penitent. Repent, he says, because if you don't, I'm going to come quickly. Now quickly means suddenly, it might mean soon. Either way, it's bad news for the unfaithful. Repent, that is change of mind that leads to a change of life. You'd better change. And those who are told to change are not only those who have adopted the error, but those who have accepted it by doing nothing or who have allowed it by turning a blind eye. Repent, he says. Remember uh, Romans 1.31 God brings judgment not only on those that commit such deeds, but they that have pleasure in them that do them. Jesus says, I'm, he, he tells the whole church to repent, or else I'm going to come and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This is a sword of a, a, a judgment. This is a sword of authority. And it's a sword that would be the sword of the enemy to them if they didn't repent. Those who tolerate error must be penitent, or else they're going to be punished. That sword of judgment. Now, we have no record of whether the brethren in Pergamos repented or not, but we know this much. There's no document, no institution left, documentation or institution left to describe the Nicolaitans or the uh, doctrine of Balaam, save what we have here. Final idea, look at the charge. The faithful are told, Revelation 2, 17, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Hear the words of God. Jesus gives them words to hear. If God speaks, we ought to listen. He gives them a burden to bear. You have a responsibility to him that overcometh. If you don't overcome, then the reward's not there. There are words to hear, a burden to bear, and a reward to share. What's that reward? Manna. Not eating of the food sacrificed to idols, not compromising with what's around you, but the manna from heaven, the fulfilling word of God. I'll give you a white stone. Remember that temple to Trajan was made of white and it was an awful uh, a piece of pride. Also a white stone might be a reference to a vote of acquittal. Jesus says, I'll hold you innocent. I'll give you something white and pure. I'll call you innocent. And he says, I'll give you a name. On that stone there will be a name written. Some wonder if it might be the name Christian. Perhaps. Or maybe it's the fact that you're going to have an identity that you only know by being mine. Something the Gnostics would try to claim but not be able to substantiate. Whatever the case, let's close this out. The greatest power, the greatest authority, the greatest glory belong to Jesus. Not a nation, not a city. The church's greatest threats always from within. That was the case in Pergamos. That's the case today. And whether we want to whether we're willing to say it or not, the Lord hates and fights against some things especially those things that corrupt His people. Thank you for your time this evening. And we will pick up with uh, the next church on next week.